some lay around in here. You can grab because uh, we're gonna, I'm not going to preach tonight. I'm just going to study this uh, scripture here in Judges chapter number 7. And I know it will be a blessing to you. Judges chapter number 7 this evening. Uh, we'll be here to work uh, tomorrow morning, right, Brother Jim? 8 o'clock. Amen. Tomorrow morning, Friday morning, he's going to wind up his part by Friday. So uh, um, uh, it'll help one of you men feel led to paint. I need you here, or lady. I mean, you don't have to be a man to paint. But anyway, uh, let me know that. Uh, let's, uh, let's turn the Bible to Judges chapter number 7. I'm telling you, the more I get into this Judges study, the more I am just absolutely convinced, amazed at how this book is put together. There's so much stuff in here, you'll never get it figured out. People are so cheated. People get so cheated by, uh, by their Bible study. All they think it is is, is God loved the world and Jesus loved everybody and all that's great and true. But there's a lot more in that book, brother, than just salvation and uh, uh, coming to church and we're going to see this tonight. Tonight we're going to see a battle, uh, a Gideon fault, and this is a picture. You see, there's thousands of battles back in them days. God chose this one to put in the Bible because it typified what's coming in the future, the Battle of Armageddon. It's coming to, uh, uh, I mean, our government, your teachers at school, our president may see this stuff's going to happen again that we're studying tonight. And we may see it. And somebody will, that's for sure. So uh, we're going to start tonight. I'm going to do like I've been doing. I'm going to go pretty fast and tell you a story here tonight. This is an amazing story. One of the, one great amazing stories in the Bible. So let's look at this scene, okay? Uh, Judges 7, 1. Then Jeroboam, who is Gideon. That's another name for Gideon. Sometimes the Bible has two or three different names for the same person. Like me, uh, they call me Danny. Like some people call me Brother Danny. Some people call me Preacher. Some people call me Pastor. Some people call me Mr. Castle. Some people call me other stuff. Uh, I ain't going to talk about. Uh, but uh, uh, there's different names. Different. We, so it's nothing. You say, oh, there's a mistake in the Bible. Call him here, this, this. No. People had different names and titles in the Bible. Uh, who is Gideon and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. Now, the Midianites were the enemy. And that was a picture of the flesh and the war. And that's, it's a picture of me and you fighting our battles. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves. Vaunt. Now, if you read the Bible, you see that word vaunt. vaunt. Now, can, he, can anybody have any problem figuring out what vaunt means? Like vault, like a pole vault, lift up, vaunt yourself, lift yourself up in pride. It's not hard to figure out. If you've got a fifth grade education, uh, vaunt, uh, vaunt itself against me and saying, mine own hand has saved me. Now, we're going to stop right there. Verse 2 is a great study. And what this is is a principle talk. And there's, uh, Gideon has 32,000 men that are willing to fight for him. 32,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 18, 19, 32,000 soldiers. And the Lord says, look, I'm going to give you the victory over your enemy, but you got too many. You got, you have to get rid of some of these guys. And the reason being so that they didn't get the credit and the glory. So you see a principle taught here all the way through the Bible that God a lot of times takes little insignificant things and does great things with them. And that way people say, well, that had to be God. Had to be the Lord. Because if, if 32,000 went in there, of course, they're really still outnumbered with 32,000. You'll see in a minute. Um, they might have said, man, we're strong, we're this, we're that. And lest I be exalted above measure, uh, you know, the Lord keeps you down a little bit. The Lord will always keep you down somehow if you really belong to him. You get too high, too big for your britches, as we always used to say, he can, he can slap you down pretty good. Amen? Best thing to do is humble yourself. 
I've heard people say, Lord, make me humble. No, you're not supposed to pray, Lord, make you humble. He said, if you humble yourself, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he'll exalt you in due time. So being this humble business is, is very important, very important. Now, uh, the Lord wants us to know this, not by might, nor by power, but it's by my spirit. The Bible said that uh, there is, is nothing with the Lord to save by many or few. I mean, God can, God can take one person and beat a thousand just as long, just the same as he can take 900 and beat a thousand. Nothing to God. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't strain him a bit. It is not, he don't just say, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Not the Lord, Lord don't do that, man. He just, bam. He does whatever he wants to and with no strain at all. The danger of numbers, it's with a church, with an organization, with anything. The dangers of getting too many people is it produces a false security. If a church gets too big, never seen one yet, that got too big that what trouble didn't come somehow or another. You get to thinking, man, we're doing pretty good. We're this, we're that, we're this. Bam. Every time, every time. Uh, the United States is like that. We got more missiles than ever. How many, how many of you have heard these politicians get on, the, on TV and they'll say, boy, North Korea, or nothing, they better not mess with us. Man, we'll, we'll wipe them out. Uh, you know, that's pretty big talk. Pretty big talk. I'm telling you, the United States is a great country, but you ain't greater than God. God can and will defeat this nation one of these days. If this nation don't repent, God's going to wipe it out one of these days. And don't look for it to repent, because it probably ain't going to happen. Uh, it, it's going to, more missiles, more nuclear warheads. We, we can blow Kim Jong-un, whatever his name is, off of a little ugly little fat boy. I can't stand to look at him. What's his name? Uh, have you seen? He's about that tall, and he just he just got grease coming out of his face or something. I mean, he's wicked. He's wicked as a devil. And and they're getting them nuclear weapons, and we're, and we're fighting uh, about ready to fight them. And that's awful. Now, look here. What the Lord tells them to do? He said, "Y'all got too many." Uh, that's a great principle. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget what I'm getting ready to say. Stay humble. If God blesses you and you make a lot of money, stay humble. If God blesses you and you win some kind of championship, stay humble. If God blesses you and you get a, a bunch of land or houses or a brand new car, stay humble. You remember God give it to you and he can take it away. Just like that. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget me telling y'all, stay humble. Keep yourself humble. You girls, you know, uh, boys, girls, you know, somebody, oh, you are so pretty. You are so pretty. You are so pretty. And if, if you ain't careful, you'll start believing that. And I mean, there ain't no magazines here tonight looking for none of y'all. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> don't let it go to your head. Stay humble. Stay humble. Amen. Uh, you meet these girls every now and then. They're all going to American Idol when they ought to be using their talent singing in church for the Lord. Ain't that right? Dolly Parton started out in church. Carrie Underwood started out, I think, singing in church. Kelly Pickler started out singing in church. Um, Mick Jagger started out in hell hole, and he's still in them. But uh, did you know what? Them girls should still be using their talent for God. You say, you don't think they'd have went to Hollywood? No. I think they'll be singing in church every Sunday and taking care of a family, being good to their husband, serving God. You better stay humble. You better stay humble. Oh, you can sing so good. I'm going to American Idol and serve the devil. Uh, uh, you don't have to serve the devil when you go to American Idol, but I doubt if you'll stand for Jesus Christ. Bet you won't get up there and sing Amazing Grace. I th some of them might try it, but they'll never make it. The world won't have that. The world won't allow that. Well, you might slide through first base or second, but they're going to expect you to compromise if you cooperate with them, buddy. So stay humble. Now look at verse number three. Now, here's what he tells Gideon. He's got 32,000 soldiers. Go proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful, fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. 
and there returned to the people 20 and 2,000 and there remained 10,000. Boy, you talk about a discouraging thing to a pastor. The Lord says, all right, preacher, you got too many. I'm going to deliver it with a few. He said, all right, what do you want me to do? Just tell anybody that's scared and afraid they can go back home. So Gideon gets up there and he says, anybody who's afraid or fearful, go home. And two-thirds of them left. Two-thirds walked out the door. He had 32,000, 20,000 walked out. That's two-thirds of the congregation. Just turn around and say, I'm scared. I'm out of here. We can't fight them. By the way, they had 135,000 of the enemy. So he had 32 against 135. Uh, I probably would be scared too, wouldn't you? 32 against 135,000. 32,000 against 100. So they turn around and left. Uh, uh, when, when push comes to shove, he had one-third of his congregation stuck with him. I wonder if push come to shove, what kind of percentage we'd have. I mean, if it really got bad. I mean, if they started passing laws against going to church and meeting and praying. I wonder what we'd do then. Uh, you might be surprised. Uh, Two-third, bam. Uh, uh, people play around anyway, I reckon. Verse 4. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. You still got too many people. Good night. You still got too many. Uh, bring them down unto the water, and I will try the for the, I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that whomsoever I whom I say unto thee, this shall go with you, the same will go with you. And whom I say this shall not go, the same shall not go. All right. He's got thirty two thousand, twenty thousand quits, ten thousand left. And he said, You still got too many, Gideon. And he says, uh, Lord, have you looked up there and seen how many people we got to fight? Don't you worry about it. I'll take care of it. You got too many. Now what he wants to do? Take them down out of the river. I'm going to put them through another little test. Oh, we're going to fight and be soldiers? We're going to have drills and like a bear crawl or something? We're going to go through these waters and climb trees and, and jump over stuff and go through briars? Nope. Look what the Lord, here's the test. The Lord does some strange things. In the Bible. Here's a strange thing. Verse 5. So he brought down the people under the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. There's your test. The test was, we're all going down here to the river. And he said, you tell everybody to get some water. Now, I'm going to get some water here, but I'm going to get dust all over me, but I'll be all right, I guess. And here's the water. He said, now, you watch how them people drink. They're all thirsty. He said, everybody that gets it in their hands like this and laps it like a dog. He said, there's your man right there. He said, everybody just lay down here and put your, put your face in it. Uh-oh. I've done it now, ain't I? I'm a homeless drunk. Come in here tonight. Uh, but anyway, uh, looks like my wife will clean my breeches, don't it? Uh, said, uh, he said, everybody drinks like that. You've got to get rid of them. What a strange test. You'd think the Lord said, all right, you got, you got 10,000. We're going to fight 135,000. Make them lift weights. See who can, who can bench press 200 pounds, 250 pounds, who can run five miles? Nope. That was the test, how they drunk water out of, the, out of the river. Now, if you went to any church in this town, you would never know what that means. Maybe one out of 50. Maybe one out of 50. If you listen to radio preaching and TV preaching from now on, they never tell you what that means. You know why? They don't study the King James Bible. Look at it. Verse 6. And the number of them that lapped, put in their hand to the mouth, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. Now, we went from 32,000 to, to 10,000. Now we're from 10,000 to 300. Here's a man that had 32,000 people. Now he's got 300. It was only 300 men got down like this, scooped up the water, and lapped it like a dog. 
You ever seen a dog drink like that? And the rest of them just stuck their face down there they're like a camel or whatever, ever how they do, through their lips. And uh, so they, they, they done this, and the Lord said, 300. Verse number 7, And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go every man to his place. All right. We went, we, we went down from 32,000 to 300. That is one one hundred of his crowd. 100 times 300 is 30,000. His crowd was cut 99% almost. Think about that. Good night. I, or, I ain't got that figured exactly right, but it was a lot. It was a lot. I'm telling you, man, he had 300 people. Now, if you had 300 people, like, like maybe it's like we have in here on average Sunday morning, would you fight a hundred and and uh, what is it, 135,000 people? 135,000 people against 300? No way. But God said, "There's the one you want." Now I've 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 never heard a preacher explain this well, except one, and then others, and then others. So get it, get it, get this. Why did God tell him to take them that lap like a dog? Because this. It's clear if you'll think about it. And I'm going to give you this, and you're going to be one of the few Christians in the country that even knows it. Um, God does things like this for a reason. And he done it in, in this case, they were men of war. You've got to remember that back then, they were on the alert all the time. They didn't know when at any moment they could be attacked they could be killed. They could be destroyed constantly. These were men of war. These were trained soldiers. These guys were trained to fight. Now, he said, if you're scared, go back home. 20,000 of them went back home. Does anybody know why the Lord would have done that? Because in the over yonder in Deuteronomy, I believe it was in, uh, somewhere in Deuteronomy, remember when the Lord told them to go forth to battle, he said, anybody who's faint-hearted and stuff, you just turn around and go on back home. He said, if you're scared, just go home. We don't need you. And what he meant by that was that being scared infects other people. It does. You get people in the church. I had a man uh, at, in Marion one time used to do that. Every, every time he'd say, now, uh, do you think uh, the church is doing the right thing uh, by doing this? And he'd put, make somebody get scared. And then he'd go over here to this person and say, do you think uh, we're really doing the right thing by doing this? And then he'd go over here to this person and say, do you think he's really doing the right thing by doing it? And he'd get them to agreeing with him. And then he'd come up to me and he'd say, you know, there's a lot of people who think da 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 <laughs> And he'd done, t he'd done talked them into it. And then he thought, if I, he thought as I, and, and I made up my mind, just like I do now, I made up my mind, come hell or high water, I'm going to do what I believe God wants me to do. I don't know how else to be a preacher. I don't know. I ain't a politician. I am not a, I am not a little puppet on a string. I'm not here for a paycheck. All I know to do is try to obey God and preach that book and try to follow the Lord. And I did. And God blessed it and honored it every single time. But that fear stuff spreads like cancer in a church. And it'll, one scared, another scared, another scared, another scared, another scared, another scared. And it creates panic. I was thinking about this this uh, building we're doing. And, oh, I have, to, I have to pray about it sometime because we always got some joker that don't, that ain't here when we talk and ain't here when we meet and ain't here when we decide nothing and then comes in and say, well, why'd you do it like this? I think, I, saw, I felt like we should have done this and it takes all I can do to keep from saying, where was you, buddy, when we've been planning all this and paying for it? Amen. There's always some know-it-all. I guarantee you, Sunday, there'll be people walking in here and say, well, I don't think I should have done it. You know, there's always somebody like that. Now, if it's me, personally, I don't like all of it either. I could change a lot of it if I could, but we're doing the best we can with what we've got. And that's what God told them to do. He said, you, you, if, you're fear, if you're fearful and faint-hearted, see you later. They went home and quit. They had 10,000. He said, anybody that laps water like a dog out of their hands, you're the man and everybody else go home. Now, why did he say that? Why did he say that? 
Remember, they are men of war. There's 135,000 enemies out there around them. So if you get down like this, a man who gets his water in his hands like this, he's on the lookout. He's alert. He's watching, vigilant, sober, because your adversary, the devil, he's watching. Man, it gets down, he's just concerned about his belly and getting something in it, right? So you see why he did it now? The Lord said, there's your man right there, the ones that ones that'll fight, the ones that's on the lookout, the ones that ain't just thinking about water in her belly, the ones that's looking out for Israel. Why? Listen, you can't, you can't teach that stuff. You can't teach somebody how to care. You can't teach somebody how to, to, to worry about the church. And it's been, I, I thank God we've got some people in here that are concerned about our church. Man, we've got some people in here that say, listen, Brother Danny, I can't do much, but I'll do this and I'll do that. We've got people in here once in a while say, I can't be there to work, but here's $100. Put it in there. We've got people say, uh, uh, I ain't got no $100, but I'll come and dig a ditch or I'll come and I'll da 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 whatever. You know? I'm glad we got people that watch. The Lord said, watch and pray. So the reason the Lord told him that, he said, them 300 right there, you give me 300 men like that right there, and we'll take care of business. Now let's watch how he did it. Now this, watch how he fought this battle. So verse 8, so the people took victuals. The old country word is vittles, right? Vittles. I don't know how they, country people got vittles out of that, but it's victuals, food. And, and, he's, and their trumpets. I believe trumpet is a picture of preaching. And he sent the rest of Israel, every man, unto his tent and retained those 300 men. And the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. There it is again. That's a battle of Armageddon. That's future events. That's coming up past 2017. Again, it's going to happen again. That's prophecy. Uh, uh, verse 8, it's all the way through the Bible. Uh, and notice here what he does again here now. Uh, let's see here. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, okay, Gideon, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. My goodness, buddy. The Lord said, Look, all you've got to do is go get it, Gideon. It's a done deal. This thing's over. Bam. That's why... Our old, our old battle general from back in the days gone by, they used to say, they used to say it, it, it ain't the important thing of whether we're on God's side uh, or whether, whether God's on our side. The important thing is that we're on God's side. If you're on God's side in a battle, guess what? You're going to win. You're going to win. And the Lord said, I have delivered them. Past tense. How can he say that? Because he already knows what's going to happen. God speaks of the future like it's past. Because he dwells in eternity and not time. And so the Lord does this. And we're going we're to say a couple things here. Don't, don't get too early. We'll, we'll never finish this. I'm about, oh, we're going to have to stop early tonight. But he said this. He said, Gideon, you got 30,000. Everybody that's chicken, go home. 10,000. Everybody that laps like a dog, you stay. The rest of y'all quit. 300 out of 10,000. That's 9,000. 900, uh, 9,700, 9,700 people put their face in that water and, you know, and sucked it up like that. 300 guys lapped it like a dog. You know why he chose them? They was looking. They was looking for the enemy. They kept the eye out. What? They wasn't just concerned about their belly down there drinking like this. So he said, there's your men right there. You get 300 men like that that'll stand and fight. Listen, I'd rather have... I'd rather have 10 men that would stand in this church and say, bless God, come hell or high water. We're going to fight this thing through, preacher. We're going to be here. We're going to see this. We're going to see the Lord. Bless. Then I had 100 that you couldn't count on, you couldn't depend on, and in, out, up, down, hot, cold, uh, save, lost, sinner, Christian, drunk, sober. Amen? And so uh, uh, they, he said, 300 of you, 300 of you. He took the 300. And he got victuals, victuals, that's victuals. Verse 9, and it came to pass, the Lord said, I've delivered it in your hand. Verse 10, but if thou fear to go down, if you're scared, Gideon, go thou with Purah, thy servant, unto the host. 
and thou shalt hear what they say. And afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto those. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. Now, stop right there just one more second. Let me point this out. I've never heard anybody say this. It hit me while I was studying today. And I'm about shouted. When I was studying today, I said they had 130, 35,000. Gideon had 32,000. And I was, I was on the bed studying, and I said he went down from 32 to, to uh, 10. They went down from 10 to 300. They had 135,000. Do you know what the odds are? One, you can look it up. Divide, I, I checked it out on my calculator on my phone. I can divide in my head, but not that much that quick. And uh, I, I, said, I thought, you know what that is? I heard a preacher say this part, and then I picked up the rest of it. One, that's 450. The odds is 450 to one. For every soldier Gideon had, they had 450. And bam, something hit me and I said, ain't I heard that somewhere before? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Remember Elijah? That, Elijah, the same thing. He went up against 450 prophets of Baal. But that hadn't happened yet when this story happened. And I thought, oh my goodness. The Lord put that in. Hey, their, their odds was 1 to 450 and it don't say it, but 30. 300 to 135,000. You get 135,000 from chapter 8, verse 10, I believe. It's in the next chapter. So that's one, uh, put it on your calculator. It's 1 to 450. So I've got me, again, you pack this church full of people, and me would fight them. Now you think that ain't some odds? Anybody in here would do that without the touch of the Lord on them? Listen, I don't care for fifth graders. I wouldn't take on 150, 450 of them. They'd claw your eyes out. They'd all jump on you and ju jump up and down on you and kill you. Fifth graders. There ain't a person in there could fight 450 fifth graders or seventh graders. Amen? And think about soldiers, trained soldiers, 450. One for 450. And then I got to thinking about this. I got to thinking about this. You know what? That's what it's always been. It's always been us, the major minority. Bible believers always have been. You look at church history, you look during the dark ages, when, 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 church his, when world historians teach history, they teach the church and this church. And, this, and when they say the church, they're talking about the Catholic church. That ain't even the church. There was born-again Christians all the way through there that lived for the Lord and served the Lord and died for the Lord that were never Catholic. And that's why the world's so messed up. They say, see, the church started all them wars. Church didn't start it. Christians didn't. There might have been some Christians that did, but they were misinformed and done some things that were wrong and unscriptural. But ladies and gentlemen, we've always been outnumbered. I got to thinking about every man I know that, that's been my mentors, my heroes, were majorly outnumbered. And then I got thinking this thing about myself. And I thought, oh, good night. You think the odds, you want the odds? Do, do y'all, you, have you thought about the odds? The odds, just, just me. Um, uh, the odds are not good in our favor. Uh, the odds are not good for us. I'm telling you, brother, we, I, I've got the, uh, the, the world is against me. The devil is against me. I've got the, the big, biggest church in the world, supposed church, is the Catholic church is majorly against me. Uh, we got a lot of people trying to bring the Protestants and Catholic together. It'll never happen unless the Protestants give in because they sure ain't going to. It's everything underneath the Pope. And that's where it's headed. That's where all this ecumenical stuff's headed. They're all against us. All the big shot denominations is against us. Uh, the... The, 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 all the charismatics are against us because we don't believe in that junk they do. All the, the people who don't believe in eternal security are against us because we do believe in it. Nobody but Baptists and Presbyterians. All the Southern Baptists are against us because we're independent. 
90% of the independents of Baptists against us because of the King James issue, and then the 90% of the King James are against us because of the divorce issue. That puts us about one a thousand. But you know what? It is nothing with the Lord to save with many or few. God and one man is a majority. And God told Gideon, you've got one to 450. Now, Gideon, let's see what happens. And let's, let's uh, finish this right quick, and I'll, I'll be quiet. Uh, he said, uh, verse, number, verse number 12, the Midianites and the Amalekites, picture of the flesh. That's a picture of the Armageddon coming up soon. Children of the east, does that remind you of anything? The kings of the east in Revelation coming against Israel. Lay along the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number. There again, remember last week? Without number don't mean there ain't no number that high. It means you can't count them. There's so many of them out there running around. And the sand by the seaside for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man. This guy had a dream, see? Here's how God messed up the enemy. Watch how the Lord fights for them. This old man had a dream, and he said, Man, I dreamed that a, a barley bread, that's cheap bread, poor people eat barley bread, tumbled into the host of Midian and came into a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it, and the tent lay down. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing but the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, and, and his hand God hath delivered Midian and all the host. You know what? The enemy started getting scared. They said, Man, I had a dream last night. See, there's where you want God on your side. He can let people have dreams. He said, I had a dream last night, and a, a barley bread come and knocked our tents over. And I said, it's the sword of Gideon. Gideon's going to come kill every one of us. And they started talking. They didn't know that Gideon only had 300 men. They had no idea. And look what the Lord told him to do. He said, actually, this is nothing. Verse 15, so it was so, and Gideon heard the telling of the dream that he worshiped. <laughs> Gideon said, Hallelujah, God, you're moving. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. And he divided the 300 men, verse 16, into three companies, 100, 100, 100, like a centurion, century, it's over 100 people. And he took his trumpet in every man's hand and empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. Now they had something like a pitcher and a lamp inside the pitcher so that the light was hid. And they had the trumpet in one hand and their pitcher and lamp in the other hand. And he's 300 men watched, and he said, all right. He said, when I tell y'all to blow that hum, trumpet, you blow it like crazy. And a trumpet is a picture of preaching. And he said, all right. And they circled around, they circled around, they circled around. And finally, it's pitch dark in the middle watch. In the Old Testament, it has a middle watch. In the New Testament, it has four watches. That's a picture of the church age. In the Old Testament, there's only three watches. That's a picture of Israel and the tribulation. And it, between 10 and 2 was the, the middle watch. And he said, when that middle watch come, it was pitch dark, the Midianites were all asleep, and about that time, then he said, boom! And they went, or, something like that. And uh, man, they blowed them things, buddy. And I'm telling you, them medium, oh, Lord. And he said, break them pitchers. And they all hit them trumpets against them pitchers and broke them. And them lights come on and all that pottery breaking. Now imagine, you're the Midianites. You're down here in the valley. You're already scared because the Spirit of God's scaring you a little bit. And you're down in there and you're real scared. All of a sudden, in the middle of the night, you wake up and you hear all that pottery crying. It sounds like tanks and bulldozers coming at you. And all of a sudden, 300 lights come up. They say that one light would represent as many as 2,000. Uh, they, and they thought, oh, oh, my goodness, we're dead meat. Let's get. And they took off running. And that's how God gave them the victory. Amazing. Let's read it, and I'm going to hush. Verse 17, And he said, Look on me and do likewise. Behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow the trumpet, and all that with me, then blow ye the trumpets on every side of all the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and Gideon. There's where Dr. Rice got his name for his newspaper, The Sword of the Lord, great newspaper. Uh, so Gideon and the 300 men and the hundred men that were with him came to the outside of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. See, the lights 
popped out of nowhere in the dark and they heard that pottery breaking and the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hand the trumpets in the right hand to blow with all and they cried the sword of the Lord and Gideon glory to God brother they blowed that trumpet with one hand and shined that light with the other hand that's a picture of preaching that's a picture of the light of the Lord you ain't gonna lose listen people I know we're being called old fashioned out of date out of touch but I still believe God's gonna have some people preaching and singing and shouting when he comes in the rapture one of these days Thank God, hallelujah. It's going to get good in here if I ain't careful. I'm going to shout. Uh, but it, it, in verse 21, And they stood every man in his place, and all the hosts ran and cried and fled, and the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord soared against his fellow. See verse 22? 300 blowed trumpets. They all started preaching, typically. Uh, they really blowed trumpets, but it's a picture of preaching. And all them lights come on, and the Lord said every man soared against his fellow. They started turning on each other. They were so confused and so tore up, they was killing each other. God, that's happened before in history, in cases we can tell you about. And men of Israel, verse 23, gathered uh, uh, themselves together and pursued after the Midianites. 24, and Gideon sent messengers throughout all Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and take them to the waters of Beth Arbor and Jordan. That Beth Barah is the same Beth Arbor in John where Jesus was baptized, where Elijah went, where Moses went, and where we're probably going to go one of these days when the Lord comes and gets us. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered together themselves together and took the waters of Beth Bara and Jordan, and they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. Check them two guys out. Hold your finger there. And slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb, and Zeb they slew at the wine press of Zeb, and pursued Midian, brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to get in on the other side of Jordan. That's a picture of the Battle of Armageddon. That's a picture of the Second Advent. I'm going to show you that tonight, as a close. Oreb and Zeb, them two names mean Raven and Wolf. Raven and Wolf. Wolf. That's what Hitler's name meant. Little Wolf or Raven Wolf or something like that. Some kind of wolf. And that's a picture of the Antichrist, the Second Advent. You want to read some scripture on this? Write down Isaiah chapter 10, verse 26. Write down Psalm 83, 11. And Psalm 83, 11 prophesies that in the future when God saves Israel, he's going to do it at the rock of Oreb and Zeb, them two guys right there that they killed. So everything we've read here tonight is a picture of the battle of Armageddon in the tribulation. It's going to happen again. All right. Anybody got a question? Right quick. Done.